Okay, push record, Sangamita. Um, it's a privilege to be able to talk to you about the Four Noble Truths of Love um, for so many reasons. Uh, I've personally found them to be incredibly helpful in my own relationship. And also, it is a privilege to be able to work with some foundational Buddhist teachings to bring them into the world of relationships. This is a whole new area of exploration for our culture, I would even say. Um, most of the Buddhist teachings that are, many of which are, or all of which that I, I've ever encountered are incredibly profound, actually really work when translated into modern contexts, which kind of surprised me when I first began to investigate it because A, these teachings are up to 2,500 years old, and B, most of the teachings were written by extraordinary teachers who were, lived in monasteries or forests, as opposed to in apartments with partners and having bills and uh, jobs and uh, email. So it's been really astonishing in a wonderful way for me to find how readily these ancient teachings translate into our modern life they merge quite seamlessly into our context. And this topic, the Four Noble Truths of Love, is an example of that. So I want to start by just telling you a little bit about what the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism are. I'll keep it brief. And then explain how they relate to our relationships and love life. Um, I thought to transpose the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism onto my love life during a time when my relationship with my partner was going very, very poorly. I think that's the nicest way I could say it. Everything that happened between us turned into an argument. I would say that we were in a fight, but the fight had no theme, no center, no fringe, no topic. It just seemed to be a cloud that enveloped us. Where should we uh, spend our vacation? Ended up getting us into a giant fight. What time are you gonna wake up in the morning? Would cause a tremendous argument. Uh, I remember once during this time, we were traveling together and we were driving through the countryside and I said, where do you wanna eat dinner? And this provoked like an epic argument. I cannot even remember why, but we were at each other's throats to the point where I said, just pull over the car, I'm getting out. And he did, and it was nighttime, and this was in rural France. I had no idea where I was, but I'm just, I just got out of the car and just like walked into this field. I just wanted to be anywhere but where he was until I got scared, and then I went back to the car. <laughs> but at one point during this period, and it wasn't days and it wasn't weeks, it was months, I became despairing. And I started to think, Maybe this relationship was over. Maybe it just couldn't work out. Uh, at this point, we'd been together for like 15 years. And I was just crying. And I was saying to myself, I don't know what to do. I don't even know where to start. And then a vo I heard a voice inside my own head. So I presume it was me talking to myself that said, begin at the beginning. At the beginning are four noble truths. And as a longtime Buddhist practitioner, this meant something to me. So, because the four noble truths of the Buddha are the very foundation of the Buddhist path, whether you practice in a Zen tradition, a Tibetan tradition, a Theravadan tradition, these truths inform every step of the Buddhist path. So let me just uh, refer to them briefly. These are the four things that the Buddha shared with his posse, I guess you call them, when he attained enlightenment. He went back to his friends and said, I've attained enlightenment. And they said, what did you see? He said, I saw four things that are true. The first truth is called the truth of suffering. Life is suffering is the first noble truth. But even though that sounds like a big 
far. I do not think the Buddha meant life sucks or life is terrible. I think what he meant was the nature of life is that everything changes and there is actually nothing to hold on to while we craft our minute to minute year to year experience as humans in the effort of creating something solid. And that is actually not possible. So that the impermanence, that impermanence is real and that there is nothing to hold on to, of course, is a form of suffering. The second noble truth is called the cause of suffering. The cause of suffering here is called grasping. A simpler way of saying that, or a simple way of saying that is not wanting the first noble truth to be true is actually what causes the suffering, as opposed to the impermanence itself. In other words, if we just rolled with impermanence, we would not suffer, but it's fighting impermanence, grasping onto something that we hope will be permanent is what actually causes the suffering. So because we can identify this as the cause of suffering, the third noble truth is the cessation of suffering, which says, oh, you could stop doing that. And the fourth noble truth is in the Buddhist, um, in the Buddha Dharma is the path for doing so, the path for this cessation of suffering. It's called the Eightfold Path. And it, include, it includes eight steps, right view, right intention, right speech, right livelihood, right action, right effort, right mindfulness, right wisdom, I think is the eighth one, uh, or right samadhi. So if you follow, do those eight things, have the right view and the right intention and so on, each right thing arises from the one before it. That is how you stop suffering. So when this voice said to me, begin at the beginning, at the beginning are Four Noble Truths, I thought, well, what would the Four Noble Truths, truths be in my situation relating to my relationship? So I started thinking about them and arrived at the Four Noble Truths of Love, which I'm going to share with you in a moment. But I want to issue a caveat right up front or a, an admonition, maybe is a better word, which is, I made these up. So I, I just want to be very clear <clears throat> that the Four Noble Truths of Love were not teachings from the Buddha or uh, any great Buddhist teachers of the last 2,500 years. They are things that I imagined, and I have found them to be helpful, and that's why I want to share them with you. But the only way that you will find them helpful, <clears throat> excuse me, is if you think about them yourself. And make up your own versions of them. You can keep the, the same exact truths, but you have to make up your own meaning for them. Maybe it's a better way to say it. Because just as with any spiritual teaching, the most important thing for you to bring is your own intelligence, because your own intelligence is the real teacher. So I invite you to think about these things, contemplate them, and then check them out in your own life. Compare them to your experience. If your experience corroborates them, now it is your wisdom. You can tell people you made them up. What you cannot corroborate because you see, oh, that actually isn't true, even though Susan said it is, I don't think it is. Awesome. You don't have to ever think about that again. So in other words, keep what is meaningful to you and discard the rest. So as I'm talking, if, you, if questions arise, uh, don't hesitate to type them in chat because when we get to the point of questions, I think there's even like a little delay here. So we might be sitting here, oh, I wonder if anyone's asking questions. So if the questions are there, A, we'll know that them, and B, we'll be able to just jump right to them. So as soon as a question arises, don't hesitate to type it into chat. Um, the first noble truth of love is that relationships are uncomfortable. I'll say that again. Relationships are uncomfortable. I say this for personal experience and also from observation. And you yourself, I imagine, know this to be true, that at any point along the relationship spectrum, discomfort accompanies you. 
So at the very beginning, you're going to go out on a date with someone, maybe it's even a blind date and you've never even met them, you're already uncomfortable because it's scary to meet someone new. And you think, well, what if they don't like me? Or what if they do like me? Or what if they're creepy or what if I want to get away and I can't or what if I like them and they don't like me there's just this sense of like sort of agita that is very natural and doesn't mean you shouldn't do it but it's a kind of discomfort you don't even know the person and then you know fast forward 20 years to the discomfort of you share a household with someone who keeps doing that thing that irritates you that you ask them and they promised to never ever do again. Oh, guess what? They just did it. The irritation of just uh, living with someone is uncomfortable. I don't know how I, I meet people sometimes that say, oh, it's just so easy for us to be together. And I look at them like, you must be from a different planet because I don't, I, I don't, there are lots of things I love, many things about being with my partner. But I wouldn't say it is easy for us to just navigate the ups and downs of everyday life. Uh, it's, and, and to add to that, no one really tells you that living with someone comes with a lot of irritation. I don't mean to make him sound or myself sound like, you know, not great to live with because he is great and he is great to live with. But there is just the irritation of being close to another person, which you've probably experienced in your family of origin or in your relationship if you're in one, that doesn't stop. And then, of course, there is the discomfort even of falling madly in love, which is like one of the most heightened and transcendent states that we human beings can inhabit. And I, it's real and it's amazing and it's blissful. But there's the discomfort of feeling that it could end, because it will. There's the discomfort of perhaps not knowing how to contain all of this feeling, or the discomfort of not being able to think of anything else but this person that you've fallen in love with. And it's wonderful, for sure, but there's also this kind of, some kind of unease, if, if only because it's not a state of mind that we experience every day of our lives. And of course, there is the um, discomfort of losing love. Discomfort is far too weak of a word. But when we lose a love relationship, for whatever reason, there's a reason, I think, that you can't sleep, you can't eat, you can't figure out what to do with yourself from minute to minute, because you are so uncomfortable. And everything you do provokes more discomfort. It's the ultimate in discomfort is to lose love. And again, I know that word is way too weak to describe the gut-wrenching sorrow of that form of loss. But the first noble truth that I posit to you is that relationships are uncomfortable. The second noble truth is that thinking they should be comfortable is what makes them uncomfortable. So of course, we all think well, someday, or maybe this day, I'll find love. And I'll find, and along with that, I will also find ease, and I'll find satisfaction, and I will find protection, and I will find an embrace. And yes, you will. All of those things are true and possible. But they are not permanent. Often, I, I believe that when people say they want love in their life, they don't really mean that because love is very fiery and rocky and unpredictable. Often what people mean and what I probably meant too is, I want to be safe. I want to feel protected from certain vagaries of life. I want to be relieved of loneliness and sadness and all things that I hope you will be relieved of. But love doesn't really do that, particularly. In some cases, it actually highlights those things. But we think that because things are uncomfortable with a partner, that it's a sign that something 
has gone wrong or that this is not a, a good relationship or not the right relationship. But before I go any further with that, I want to exempt from this relationships that involve abuse or addiction, because that is a whole other class of relationship. And if you think, well, I'm uncomfortable or I, 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 I Susan says relationships aren't supposed to make me comfortable and I'm not comfortable because my partner's abusive or, or one of us has an addiction problem. Well, this rule does not apply to that. None of this applies to that. That is an entirely different category. So I just don't want anyone to think that they should put up with any form of abuse, emotional, spiritual, physical, obviously, or uh, addictive behaviors that, that you should make room for those things. Thanks, Nate. Um, so relation, the thinking they should make us comfortable is what makes them uncomfortable. So imagine if you looked at your partner, not as a source of happiness for yourself alone, but as a separate human being. And what if the purpose of relationships wasn't to make the, for that person to make you happy and you to make that person happy, but instead to explore what creates happiness together, what creates unhappiness, and to sort of appreciate from the bottom of your heart those moments when happiness is present and when you do feel safe and protected and embraced and those moments are absolutely to be treasured. But because you can't get along in other moments, it doesn't mean that there's a problem. It does not mean that something has gone wrong. It means that there's something else to consider together, which leads to the third noble truth, which is that meeting the discomfort together is love. I would posit. Um, if you're looking for a partner who will make you happy, um, maybe you'll find that. If you're looking to make someone happy, maybe you'll be able to find a situation where you can do that. But to me, the most potent and lasting relationships don't come from one person making the other ha one happy while that one is making the first one happy. Because there will be periods of happiness and periods of unhappiness. And the best we can ask for, and it is far better than anything I might have imagined, again, is not someone who will make me happy but who will stand shoulder to shoulder with me and look together at the energy and ebb and flow of happiness and unhappiness as they both stream through our relationship and look at it together. Oh, now we're happy. Now we're unhappy. Now you're happy, but I'm not. This thing happened that caused this kind of a deepening in our relationship or this happened that caused us to feel disconnected from each other to look at the periods of connection and disconnected disconnection clear-eyed brave kind and fierce is love I would say so the third noble truth meeting the discomfort together is love it's a very powerful thing to do. And if you can find someone who will do that with you, you're in extremely good shape. Uh, that's a good partner, I would say. Um, is there something else I want to say about that? No, I don't think so. Um, and if any of this, however, is causing questions to arise in your mind or comments, if you want to share a reflection on this, something it makes you think of, and or you have a question, this would be a great time to drop those in chat so that as our conversation progresses, we know what questions you have. I can jump right to the questions when I'm finished with my, my talk, which will be in about 10 minutes or so. I want uh, with all my heart to be able to address your questions as quickly and as thoroughly as I can. So if you have any, pop them in chat. Um, the fourth noble truth is that there is a way to work with it all. In the Buddhist Four Noble Truths, the fourth truth, noble truth was the Eightfold Path. 
but I want to posit to you a threefold path here. And these three steps are based on in what is called in Buddhism the three yanas. Yana means vehicle. And they the, refer to the three main cycles of teachings given by the Buddha. And each cycle contains the other two. These cycles are not like beginning, middle, and end. They are circular and inseparable. But when the Buddha became enlightened and gave the Four Noble Truths, this gave rise to a cycle of teachings called the Hinayana. The Hinayana teachings are what you and I and anyone needs to do when we embark on a spiritual path. And, and it involves things like, like what you would imagine if you're about to embark on any kind of spiritual path or any kind of path to learn anything. First, you need a sense of simplicity and clarity. Oh, this is what I'm doing. A kind of discipline, like I'm actually going to do it. And what is called renunciation. And that doesn't mean renouncing all the things you like and only doing the things you don't like. Here, it means something like renouncing BS, renouncing what is non-essential to your exploration. So these are the foundational teachings of the, of the Buddhist path and of the relationship path, as you'll see in a moment. When you do have this basic foundation created in your spiritual life, something happens very naturally for us as human beings, because this is just how we're built. When we're not in fight or flight, when we're not in survival mode, when we basically have a sense of simplicity and discipline and we've cut out BS from our life, something happens in our heart. Our heart softens to other people in a different way than it does when we look at them when we're in a more fight or flight or unsteady mode. At unsteady points in your life, we, at un unsteady points in our lives, we look at other people, not as discrete human beings with hopes and fears of their own. Rather, we look at them as devices, someone who could make us happy or you know, solve some piece of our problem or contribute to our unhappiness and therefore we want to avoid them. So we have a very sort of narrow claustrophobic view of other people. But when we have a basic sense of stability in our life, we can look at other people in a much more spacious way so our heart softens and opens. And the second cycle of teachings, the Mahayana teachings, are about that heart opening and speak to the truth of love in both its relative and absolute forms and gives incredible insight into how to love, how to be compassionate, how to celebrate the joys of others and care for them in their pain. The third cycle of teachings called the Vajrayana are the teachings that relate to what is possible when you have a sense of stability and you know how to love. When those two things are present in your life, you can develop a kind of courage and fierceness that enables you to see the wakeful aspect of every moment, in every moment of your life, I'd say. So these teachings relate to waking up in any given moment. They relate to something sometimes called ordinary magic, which is a heightened sense of your surroundings, of colors, of sounds, of smells, of tastes, and so on. You're just more awake. So we have these three phases, stable and disciplined, open and loving, awake and aware. And this is how they relate to our relationship life. The first phase, uh, and the first step that you can take to apply these things into your life is to bring some pinning on a discipline into your relationship world by simply being honest, by simplifying your relationship life or your expectations, let's say, of your relationship or of love, by relaxing. Often, especially when we're longing for love, we get can get very anxious, like, what if I never find someone? What if, what if I find the wrong person? Or I need to make six or eight lists of qualities that I'm looking for and then put myself out there and look for people that have those qualities and um, you know, invoke all these strategies to solve this problem. That can get very overwhelming. So the more we can relax, not so easy, but you can do it. 
simplify. Of course, some discipline is very helpful uh, when you're in a relationship. The discipline of simply paying attention to that person and paying attention to your own inner experience of that person. And it means things like be honest. Do the things you say you're going to do. If you say you're going to show up at 9 o'clock, show up at 9 o'clock. Or if you can't, then call and say you can't. Just this very basic stand-up human decency is really, really important in, in, in a relationship and in bringing the Four Noble Truths to life. Um, it even includes things like good manners. One, I cannot overstate the incredible importance of simple good manners in keeping a relationship steady and strong. I don't mean the good manners of knowing what fork to use. I mean the good manners of consideration and thoughtfulness about that person. There is I don't know if we want to keep recording or not, but we can. Um, what do you think, Sangamita? Um, well, we've recorded the discussion in Can't hear you. Um, I'm unmuted. Can you not hear me? I, I still can't hear you. Can can everyone hear Sangamita? Yes, I can hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Hmm. <laughs> can, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> but you can't hear me. <laughs> I'm gonna. I don't know. I'm gonna try. Something. Can you can you speak, Sangamita? Okay. Can you hear me now? Can't hear you. <clears throat> Corey, maybe you can log in and out. So maybe we could. Sure. Um, maybe we could just pause the recording. Sangamita, so we don't have.